So, Lord, I just thank you for the word of God that's alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And as we dig into your word, we ask you for an enlightenment to come, for uh, an awareness, a revelation to reach our hearts about prayer today and how important it is that, that we're growing in our prayer life and that we understand the relationship with you, that it's a, a constant dialogue between heaven and earth. So I just thank you in advance for the word you gave me that I'll be able to convey it in a way that people will get nourished by it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I know a lot of you were used to having communion every week, and we just decided just once this is the first service back in here, try to keep it real simpler. And um, but we do have a drummer, so I'm looking forward to him being back next week. <laughs> we didn't have one this week, so thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, the title today is that picture that you see, The Prayer Journey. And that's, that's what it's been for me. It's been a journey to learn all the different dimensions of prayer. And I, I put from knowing to growing. And, and that's typically how the Lord has worked with me is that I could know something, but just knowing about it for me typically wasn't enough. It's in the doing that I really grow. And a lot of us know we're supposed to go to the gym and, and work out, to, but knowing it, it's not good enough to get us there, is it? But once you start going and you see your muscles growing and you also, um, your body starts to get used to working out and how good that feels, you start to miss it if you don't do it. So it's that law of inertia. Things at rest stay at rest. Things in motion stay in motion. And how many know we have to be in motion for God? Because if you try to stand still, you'll get pulled back by the current. <laughs> so we might be fishing upstream or swimming like fish upstream. And if you saw The Chosen, the, uh, the graphics they have at the beginning of that show are spectacular. Because they show all the fish swimming in one direction. And then there's this one blue fish going against the, the stream. Do you see that? And then all of a sudden, there's two or three blue fish coming, and then more. And that's a picture of us being in the culture, shining the light of Jesus and being contagious and just letting people know. Aren't you glad somebody prayed you into the kingdom? Yeah, I know somebody prayed me in. It certainly wasn't by my merit. I fought it tooth and nail. So that's all. You know, just think about this process of, of growing. On a, you, you, the journey is to maturity, if we want to just use a general term. The, the journey is to get to a place where you're really comfortable in the understanding of the basics uh, of, of what we're talking about. So you would want that if you have a doctor that's going to operate on you, right? Do you ever wonder why the doctors say, come to my practice? And you're like, I don't want you practicing on me. I want you to know what you're doing. I don't want you to practice. <laughs> so if somebody's going to cut me open for an operation, I want them to know what they're doing, right? But you have to grow into that place because the journey, you know, it can be miserable or it, you, can, you can be intentional about it and say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have fun along the way. And I remember learning how to fish uh, as a kid. My grandfather mostly was the one that taught me how to do it. And, you know, he had so much patience. Sometimes a father will take a son fishing and the father's getting all mad at him because the father's focused more on trying to catch fish. And it's not a good way to do it, is it? If you're a dad and you know you're taking a child out to learn how to fish, you're not gonna catch a lot of fish that day. You know, you just give that, give that over to the Lord and say, it's not about me, it's about my son or daughter learning how to do what we're doing because there's a lot about life that, well, especially God definitely loves fishermen, right? So that's clearly true in the Bible. And there's something about it that points us towards life. So it's that way with prayer and it's that way with ministry. And we've been talking a lot about this, that during COVID, you know, more people are needing ministry now than ever, but it's, it's more difficult for us to provide it. And Zoom calls are the best thing probably right now, but it's not the same as being able to lay hands on people the way we would want to. But God's not limited by that, is he? You know, we can't put them in a box. So the point is, um, we want to grow as Christians too, right? We want to go off the milk and onto the meat. And if you ever notice that, you might be eating a lot of meat in a certain area of your life, but then there's another part of your life that's still on milk. Anybody bear witness with what I'm saying? And we tend to like to go to the meaty part of our, of our life because we're better at that, and we tend to try to avoid the milkier parts, if I could say it that way, because that's more of a sign of weakness, and, and it's not one of our strengths. And 
because of the way we're wired as people, we like to get endorsed. So that's what I'm going to try to focus on, especially as it relates to prayer this week, but also try to tie it into the last two weeks prior. So two weeks ago, uh, the title was My Faith Will Not Fail. And if you remember, that was taken from uh, what Jesus said to Peter. And Jesus was, you know, a loving, fatherly figure to these guys, right? He, he loved them even though he knew they were weak. He didn't worry that what they said they were going to do, they might not do, because that's part of the process of growing and part of the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction to us and for us to say, oh, I guess I thought I was further along than I really am. And we could feel shame when that happens. But Jesus didn't shame Peter. And the example was right before the crucifixion when Peter was all gung-ho and said, what do you mean, Lord? What do you mean that we can't go with you where you're going? I'll follow you anywhere that you go. Remember this? And Jesus said, well, no, actually, before the alarm clock goes off in the morning, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And in Luke's gospel, in chapter 22, is where we actually see that scene where Peter denies Jesus and the rooster crows and Jesus makes eye contact with Peter. And, you know, depending on your image of God, you might think Jesus was glaring at Peter like, you loser. You thought you would not do it, and I told you you would deny me. You're a failure. That's how some people think of God. Oh, my. That's a problem. Because if you think that's who God is, that's not a loving father, is it? You know, but back to the fishing analogy, when my kids were young and I was teaching them, I knew they were going to get the reel tangled up. That's a given when kids are fishing. It's part of the deal. You try to show them, but then you have to let them do it. And then you show them. And, and you know what? As we're growing in our journey with Christ, we better be having some fun along the way. Because there's always going to be something that he could show us that we could be working on that we're not fully measuring up to the perfect example that Jesus gave, right? And that's why some people leave ministries, because they're comparing themselves to Jesus. Guess what? Probably going to fall short on that one somewhere. But that doesn't mean stop serving him. So I said, you're going to deny me three times, Peter, but I want you to know that I'm praying for you. That should encourage somebody here. Do you believe the Lord is praying for you? We know that, right? Because in the New Testament it says he forever lives to make intercession for us his kids. So Jesus looks right at Peter and says, it's okay. Even though you're going to deny me three times, I'm not shaming you over that, Peter. Because I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail. And when you come back, you will restore your brothers. And that's a picture of the church. Right? Because we're going to have our ups and downs. I'm not, that's not a negative confession. That's called life. Things happen. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because you have access to the kingdom of God, not because you're poor in spirit, but because there's a body of Christ, there's a, there's a group of believers that you can tap into, there's the word of God, there's man, the YouTube channel, of, of, of our YouTube channel alone has got hundreds of hours of videos that you can watch if you need encouragement, right? So there's all ways that you can offset the attack that's coming against you, and you shouldn't shame yourself, has been my point for the last two weeks, because then... And that last week, I, I used this verse from 1 John 3.20 that says, If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Do you believe that? Let's say it. Let's make the declaration. If my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. That's the truth of the word of God. See, that's powerful. That's the thing that's sharper than a two-edged sword. And if you think Jesus was glaring across the fire at Peter, you loser, that's a wrong image of God. I think Jesus looked with compassion at Peter in the moment of failure and said, don't forget, like, you know, Peter's thinking in his head, he did say he was going to pray for me when this happened. And don't worry, Peter, because I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail and that when you return, you come and strengthen your brothers. And that's a picture of us. That's the church. We're all going to go through ups and downs along the way. But let me tell you, nothing is more satisfying than to see somebody get set free, healed, delivered, saved, off a of drug addiction. I see Sam's here, right? Me and Sam. 
were probably, you know, bumping shoulders in the bar before we knew each other. We both got delivered from drugs, right? Like I could tell you for sure I would not be alive today if Jesus didn't save me. So how can you get too uptight about things when you know that's true? You're just going to be keep thanking him for taking that mess and straightening it out. All right, and then, you know, it's, it's through the word. So let's look at some scripture. So go to Luke 18, and this is a different portion than what we've been studying in the past, but it's part of what I want to talk about. It says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story. This is Luke 18, verse 1. And the story was that they should always pray and never give up. So can you look at somebody and say, always pray and never give up? And you know, like, well, you might be saying, wait a minute, how can I always pray? I have a job. How can I pray if I'm working? And I could say, you better be praying when you're working. <laughs> he wouldn't say to always do it if, if we couldn't do it. But my problem, and I was still, you know, getting the reel all messed up, learning how to fish, me learning how to pray was, I thought it was binary. I'm either working or I'm praying. And that's a juvenile approach. And that's a misunderstanding of who God is. Right? And look, I know there's a bunch of different things that prayer means. So I'm not trying to give you this extensive teaching on all the different types of prayer right now. What I'm trying to help you with is to understand my journey of growing in this is like, wait a minute, it's not such a big formal thing. God loves you, Peter. <laughs> He's praying for you. You know, don't be like the typical guy that doesn't like to ask for help because they think it's a sign of weakness. Well, prayer many times for me is asking for help. How about you guys? Okay, thank you. I'm just making sure you're awake. <laughs> I'm not the only one. And look, if he loves me, why wouldn't he want to help me? I don't run out of, you know, well, you only have a couple prayer requests left, and then you're going to have to start eating into tomorrow. No, it's not a limited amount. He's never slumbering. He's never sleeping. And he always loves hearing from me. Isn't that amazing? And how about you? He loves hearing from you. And anybody that has children that are older now, when they call you and ask for advice, you just like hold the phone and go, oh, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Because that was your prayer for them when they were children, is that you'd always be in a life-giving relationship with them. And that's God's belief for us. So one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. I'm not going to read the next five, six verses, because you probably know the story. It's a story of a widow who goes to an unjust judge and pleads her case, and the judge ignores her. But she doesn't give up. She keeps going back and going back and going back, and he keeps ignoring her. And eventually the guy says, you know what? I, I really don't have a reason to keep ignoring this lady, and she's so persistent. And uh, when uh, one of our speakers was here, Karen Wheaton, she called it, she, she had found a translation that said, shameless persistence. <laughs> I don't care how silly I look, I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep knocking on this door, and I'm not stopping. I'm not taking no for an answer. I want justice. And you know, God loves widows and orphans. James talks about that in the New Testament. He said, that's true religion, is how you give a voice to the people who don't have a voice in our culture. That's what injustice is. It's a main theme of 2020. There's more justice. The problem is if you take God out of it, whoa, then you get a bunch of vengeance. And that you never get forgiveness under that model. It's got to be God's justice, not the world's justice. Woohoo, that's another day's story. So some people think God is the angry, unjust judge. Like, why would Jesus talk about his father like that? He wouldn't. God's not the unjust judge. It's an example of even in the worldly sense, if you could go to that guy and, and finally get him to concede the point and say, yeah, go ahead. I'll give you the justice. How much more would your heavenly father give you justice? We have a much higher authority in God who loves us and loves justice. Look that word up on Bible Gateway sometime. Hundreds of times you'll see the word justice. It's why he gave them the law. So they would know how to rightly divide wrong and right. But like we know from the New Testament, we all fall short. Yeah. 
of being able to follow that in our own strength. Because maybe when I sang that song this morning, what do you mean you're not enough? Yes, you are. Well, okay. In some ways you could look at it that way, but if you don't listen to the rest of the sentence, you might take it out. I'm not enough unless you come. <laughs> that's the line. <laughs> and that's true. Because we can't do it in our own strength. That's what Jesus said. I can do nothing without the Father. So pride would get in the way and say, I am enough. Well, the Lord said, why? Why would you do it alone when I'm available whenever you want me? Prayerlessness is a sin. So why wouldn't you just bring your needs before the Lord on a regular basis? He's not mad at you for doing that. All right, so then he says, verse 7, in this position of saying, look, if the earthly judge even decides to give justice, don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people? Who cry out to him when? Day and night. Mm. Well, will God keep putting you off? And you can say, well, I've been praying for something for many years and I still haven't seen the answer yet. Well, look, that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It just means you stay persistent and you keep on praying. And uh, I'm looking at Joe Bellotta down here in the front. and uh, You know, you just never know when the Lord is going to move mightily in somebody's life. And if you know anything about our church, you might have heard their testimony of Joe and Anna Bellata. And Anna, uh, they lost a child. Uh, their first child, right? It was your, it was your first child, Joseph. And uh, he was less than two, if I remember right. And it was an accident at a family party, you know. And it was just tragic what happened. And no, nobody should ever have to live through that, right? It's the hardest thing that I've experienced as, as a pastor to try to help somebody cope with that kind of grief. And, and um, you know, they're, they're very seasoned people. Joe's father was a pastor, and Joe has preached many sermons and was the associate pastor in that church. So it's not like they didn't know the word, but they were having to live with this amazing amount of pain, this immense amount of pain. And prayer and prayer and prayer and lift this thing off me in prayer. And someday you'll hear the story from them better than I could say it. But what I remember in the story is that somebody invited Anna to go to a, a Joyce Meyer conference in the midst of probably one of her worst seasons during that time. And it was really kind of just by faith that, that Anna decided to go because she was numb emotionally. And if I remember, I'm quoting you right, it said, the person I picked up at the airport after she took that trip, was it St. Louis maybe she went to, was a different person than the one I dropped off at the airport. Something happened at that Joyce Meyer conference that caused a breaking, a breaker anointing lifted the grief off of Anna's life. And when she came back, it was evident without even saying a word that something had shifted. Now, that's not a formula. We tend to do that sometimes and think, well, if it worked for her. No, what we're doing is we're just consistently, persistently asking. And all of a sudden, sometimes when you least expect it, the Lord shows up. And he talks to you through somebody you might not have expected to do that. So that's why if you're not having fun along the way, you'll burn out in this. You know, you hold on to these things loosely. You don't get so rigid and so, but I've been doing this and it's not working. And then you get discouraged. Or, oh, why bother? God's got to forgive me. I'm a Christian. I'm his child. So I could just keep sinning, right? Like you all know that's wrong. So somewhere in the middle, we want to keep a fire on, on the altar of our heart burning, and better that it's blazing fire, but never that it goes out, right? And that's very much a biblical example, and we'll use some language in there today. But I like what John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3, if you want to go there. It's, uh, I'll start with verse 11, but then we'll unpack it a little bit more. John is talking to these people, and it was a pretty big, significant event that was happening. Because something about the anointing on John's life was causing people to come to the river and get baptized because they were repenting of their sins. Now, that's not easy to do, is it? Because we live in a culture that's trying to normalize sin. <laughs> that, that's what they're trying to say is like, well, who are you to tell me that I can't sleep with 15 people in one night? You know, that's your rule. That's not my rule. Well, guess what? This goes all the way back to Psalm 2. So this has been out for a long time. Why do the heathen rage? Well, they're raging because God's trying to say there's a better way to live than just to pursue all your passions. If you follow my directions, I'll put boundaries around your life that will cause you to flourish as a human being. 
And they keep falling into the same trap, looking for love in the wrong places. Somebody should write a song about that. <laughs> How about the woman at the well? She had five husbands and was living with the sixth guy now. She kept thinking that her thirst was going to be quenched through a relationship with a man. Jesus said, no, it's not that. If you drink the water I give you, you'll never have to do that again. See, so she was looking in the wrong place. So part of our prayer life is just continuing to zoom in. Yes, get encouraged by the testimonies of others, but know what your story is. Because Jesus said, your faith is not going to fail, Peter. I'm praying for you, and then you're going to strengthen your brethren. So what the devil meant for evil in the Balada's life, God turned around for good, and now Anna has a testimony of how grief, the worst kind of grief in many ways, could be lifted. It doesn't mean they don't miss their child. It doesn't mean that they're, that they're forgetting about Joseph. It means that God helped them have perspective on it, that we're living in a world where sin is rampant, and sometimes there's, in the war there's casualties. And I don't mean to, to go lightly on this point because it's probably one of the main things people wonder about. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's because of sin. Okay? So we can do the best we can. We can know the word. We can stay like, in, like if we're in training, then you know there's certain things you do when you're in training for good spiritual conditioning that you shouldn't do. And there's certain things that you should do that you know are good for you. Okay? Now this can border up against legalism now, right? There's all these landmines on either side of this conversation. You can definitely get too legalistic. And God said, no, you got to know the spirit of the law. The Father is seeking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So yes, the truth, but yes, the spirit. Live in that zone and be here in God. So John says in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 3, those who repent, I baptize with water. But, don't you love those in the, in the Bible? Oh, if you think that's good, the baptism with water. But there's coming after me a man who is more powerful than I am. And in the Passion Translation it says, he will submerge you into union with the spirit of holiness. He will submerge you into union with the spirit of holiness. That's such a beautiful word picture, isn't it? So if I get submerged into the holiness, this, this combining of my life which is still tainted by the sin in the world, but with the spirit of holiness, if I become one, and that word union is the same as a marriage, right? You become one with that spirit, then you just increase your immune system dramatically from sin because you're one with holiness. It's the spirit of the Lord. And then he adds, and with a raging fire in the Passion Translation. He'll submerge you into union with the spirit of holiness and with a raging fire. So that tells me that our prayer life could be stoked up. That we could have this loving relationship with a loving Father and not think anything about asking Him questions and what do you think, Lord? Or like I was saying last week, I, I couldn't find my guitar strap. I'm looking all over the place where I practice. It was already on the guitar. Like, why didn't you just stop and ask? And I did. I just stopped and said, Lord, could you please tell me where this thing is? Because I retraced my steps. I did everything. He said, you don't even need it to go practice. Just go in there and, and sit down and start playing. And it was already on the guitar. But when you lose your keys, don't get all frantic. Pray. God knows where your keys are. I promise he'll tell you if you're listening. And I don't think there's any part of life that should be excused from this. Yeah, I'll just kind of just telling you my journey. So when I first became a Christian, I had come out of a drug lifestyle, and that was a very chaotic life. There wasn't a lot of structure and order, and there was a lot of breaking of the traditional rules, right? That's, that's what the world holds up in high esteem. If you live a decadent lifestyle and you're good at it, you get a lot of social capital. So what did I do? I started reading the Word because that gave, gave me structure on how I was supposed to live. I started learning how to worship. I was already a guitar player, so I started learning how to worship, and I realized how important that was. I was going to church as a, on a regular basis. I was volunteering and starting to help, and all those things helped me, but I never really clicked on prayer because it felt binary. Like I said, it felt like I have to stop doing everything else, and I have to just go and pray, and in my early interpretation, that meant just getting a list of things and, and reading off a list to God and asking him for those things on the list. There was no conveyance that it was a two-way dialogue. 
that I should expect to hear from the Lord when I'm praying too. I'm not saying you shouldn't ask him for things. You can. You pray for people, of course. Intercession, right? But what about the prophetic aspect of this? That while I'm there, and you know, many times when we pray, we hold our hands up, right? We, we lift them up for the Lord because we're in the receiving mode. I expect to hear from you, God. I wasn't. I was thinking, um, could be for many reasons in my background, that uh, I'm too insignificant for him. He's too important. He's got the whole universe to run. Why would he care about, you know, little things in my life? Well, he does. He's way bigger than I realized he was. And he loves me way more than I realized. And it might sound like an oversimplification, but if you want to improve your prayer life, the more you can understand a loving father than an angry God, the better your prayer life's going to be. Because you're going to realize he loves it when you come and want to talk to him. Every time you bring a need to him, he's thrilled. Because you're going to make better decisions. Do you believe he'll talk back to you? Say yes, please. I know you think that means you're crazy if you're hearing voices. Not if it's the voice of the Lord. You're not crazy. I, you know, the analogy he gave me was prayer is like a, a, a chainsaw. And you're using an axe out here to chop down the tree. And I have this amazing thing that you could use. Bing! Get right through. I'll, I'll help you get to the goal you want way faster than you could ever do in your own merit. And then you start reading verses like, unless the Lord builds the house, they are laboring in vain who try to build it. Guilty. Spend a lot of energy trying to do things without even asking. Not realizing that's a sin. It's the sin of prayerlessness. Not meant to put condemnation on anybody here. I'm just trying to tell you, stop using the ax when God will give you a chainsaw. You'll buzz right through that thing. I had to learn the hard way. All right, so I'm going to just shoot back to Deuteronomy for a minute because, again, like the, the culture, you, you can't help but be observant of what's going on in the culture right now and, and how different it is than things that we've experienced in the past. And, you know, part of the journey, uh, as I was talking about, whether it's a grandfather teaching a child how to uh, fish, you know, it's going to be a little frustrating, or just helping your children grow up to be responsible people. That, that can enter life and that can be responsible about paying their bills and have good godly character, right? You have to walk this line. Sometimes you're, you're showing them what to do. Other times you're letting them have to live through it and they're going to fall down. But falling down is part of the learning process, isn't it? Doesn't make you a bad parent. And that could be very difficult. And today the culture seems to be leaning towards overprotecting and don't let them... Don't let them experience anything bad because they'll be hurt by that. It's like, well, we're, what biblical principle is in there that you're backing that up on? And, and we don't want to really bubble wrap our kids because you're really not protecting them. You're not allowing them to engage with life and learn. I'm not saying put them in a sinful situation. But you've got to allow them to understand that because it's a sinful world and in order to engage in that world, you have a higher level of immunity and strength than, than if all I do is protect you from it. Because then you're not building up your immune system spiritually. With me? So you might know this verse. I'm reading from the voice translation. It's Deuteronomy chapter 32. One of my favorites because a preacher really unpacked this many years ago for me. It says, just as an eagle stirs up its nest, encouraging its young to fly, and then hovers over them in case they need help, spreads its wings and catches them if they fall, and carries them high on its wings, so the eternal God similarly guided Israel through the wilderness. All right, so just let me give you a plain English version. So the mother eagle is bringing back food for the chicks. The chicks are growing and eating, and we've all seen the pictures of who's going to stretch their neck up there higher, right? But then there comes a point when mom knows that chick's going to have to learn how to fly. So what she does, the way this guy explained it, I never forgot, is she starts flapping her wings in the nest. And that starts all the wind blowing in there and all the fluff that's on the bottom, right? The feathers and, and all the comfortable things that that chick got used to get popped out of the nest. So what's left are the sticks in the nest. And now this chick is like bouncing around on these sticks. And this is not a comfortable place for her to be or him. 
So what do they do? They're like, Mom, what are you, I'm going to call Dyphus on you. Why would you do this? No, you're not calling Dyphus because you're going to have to learn how to fly. I don't want a big eagle staying at the bottom of my nest. And in order to live this life, you're going to have to learn how to do this. And you're not going to like it in the beginning because it's going to feel scary. And prayer is that way. It feels a little scary. You're going out on a limb. You're, you're stretching your faith. You're not sure if God's going to meet you there. And the devil will constantly lie to you and say he's not going to meet you there. But you're, what the mom does, like this verse says, pushes the bird out of the nest. And what happens? That bird starts using new muscles they've never used before. But what this says is she's never far away. And she'll come right down under and pick it, bring it back up, and then here we go again. On the way down, come under, pick her up, bring her back up again. See, that's God. That's what he does. And I love this part because it says, So the eternal God guided Jacob through the wilderness without the help of any foreign God. So that's something we can stand on. We don't have to turn to the culture's way of doing things. We will have to dig into the Word to find out what God wants us to do. You can't rely on my interpretation or Trisha's interpretation. We'll help you. We're here to try to help you and to help you grow. But we'd be the first ones to say, what if you move to Arizona because you get a, a job promotion? You can't depend on us. We'll try to help you have a relationship with the Lord because you're his sheep, not our sheep. <laughs> Never mind about sheep bites. I was going to go there. I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> So I'm going to go to Psalm 32. I don't know if you like the Passion Translation, but I've been really feeding on it and love it. And we're only a couple more places in Scripture that I'm going to go. But this is David speaking. It tells us that it's a psalm written by David. And he's talking about the process of coming to the Lord and acknowledging that I made a mistake. What do we call that? Repentance, right? That's what all the people in the wilderness were doing. They were coming out to John the Baptist and saying, I don't know what it is about you, but when I'm around you, I get convicted that I'm doing something wrong and I want to be forgiven. So when they went to the Jordan River, it was a picture of Exodus. It was a picture of them coming out of Egypt and getting through the water. When you go down under, you're coming back up as a new person, right? We carry that over into the New Testament now, and that's what we say about baptism. And here's what David says in verse 2 of Psalm 32. He says, how blessed and relieved are those who have confessed their corruption to God. <laughs> so, like, don't carry it around. If, if, if you're feeling shame about something, just bring it to the Lord. Right? And if you think he's angry and he's going to punish you, then you don't want to do that. But when you know he's a loving God, you can say, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I let you down. And he says, that's a relief. How blessed and relieved are those who have confessed their corruption to God. For he wipes their slates clean and removes that hypocrisy from their hearts. And then verse 3 says, before I confess my sins, I kept it all inside. My dishonesty devastated my inner life. You know, in, in another portion of scripture, it says, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old within me. Hmm. It devastates your inner life to live this dualism of, I'm saying I'm serving the Lord, but I have this sin that's operating on another level in my life. Bring it to the Lord. He'll, he'll wipe the slate clean. So he caught, it said, it caused my life to be filled with frustration. Verse 5, then I finally admitted to you all my sins, refusing to hide them any longer. And I said, God, my life-giving God, I will openly acknowledge my evil actions. And you forgave me. And all at once, the guilt of my sin washed away, and all my pain disappeared. And then it says, Selah. <laughs> and the way Brian Simmons translates Selah is pause and pray. There is forgiveness. There is a clean slate. But he wants us to come to him and say, I need to graduate another notch in this process of growth. I know about repentance, but knowing about it's not enough. I've got to grow in it. And if I could keep a short list, then as things start faltering in my life and I start making some bad decisions, the sooner I can bring it to him, the better. Right? Because now I'm in union with that spirit of holiness. I'm with a raging fire. And all of a sudden you realize this is the best way to live. God is good all the time. If I can be obedient to what he told me to do, I will flourish. Not the world, not the strange gods that the world is following. No matter how attractive it may look in the short run, sorry, 
It's not the eternal word of God. And this is verse 6. This is what I've learned through it all, that all believers should confess their sins to God. Do it every time that God has uncovered you in the time of exposing. Does that sound like a loving God that would expose you? Well, believe it or not, the answer is yes. Because when you're coming and you're praying to him and you're saying, Lord, show me what's wrong. <laughs> He's more than happy to do that because he loves you. Right? Like, so when I was playing football, they would show the films on the day after the game. The game was on Saturday. It was actually Monday. We would just be watching the films. And every time I made a mistake, the coach really liked to replay that over and over again. <laughs> Say, look at number 56. We didn't teach him to do this. <laughs> so it's like shame, you know, like, oh, God, I, that's, that's not a good motivation. But with God, it's different. You're saying, Lord, before that happens, I want you to show me if there's any bad fuel running the engine in here. Because I want my motives to be totally in union with that spirit of holiness and with a raging fire. How you guys doing? I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, well, it's only one portion of scripture. So if you want to go to Matthew 3, I'm going to end here. Kind of take it off on, on that portion that I was just referring to. All right, let's go to verse 1. In Matthew chapter 3, and again, if you want to follow on your device, uh, you can get the Passion Translation free in Bible Gateway. That's my commercial. It's a great tool. Bible Gateway is a great tool. So is Bible Hub, both free. Amazing tools. So Passion Translation, Matthew 3, 1 says, It was at this time that John the baptizer began to preach in the desert of Judah. There was a breaker anointing on John. Right? He lived a radical life. He was separated to the Lord. And whatever he was preaching was causing people's hearts to get convicted. Right? Now, did that ministry stop today? No. Right? The truth of the word of God is still supposed to be preached. And when it is, people's lives change. And I would say the currency of God's kingdom, of his economy, if you want to know how the market is doing in the kingdom of God, it's not about profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. It's about prophets like John speaking the word and people's lives changing. And the tares get turned into wheat. <laughs> right? Whoa, that's a miracle that the ex-hell's angels are now pastors of a church. And it's legit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Change lives. So he's preaching, and they were repenting. And then this is what he says. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It says, the realm of heaven's kingdom is about to appear. So you better keep turning away from evil and turn back to God. And then John the Baptist says, and even you Jews who know the Bible, you know the Old Testament, John is the one. I'm, I'm sorry, Matthew is telling us this about John. Isaiah was referring to John the Baptist when he prophesied a thunderous voice. One will be crying out in the wilderness, prepare yourself for the Lord's coming. And a level straight path. You make a level straight path in your heart for the Lord to come in. How's that for a morning prayer? How about getting down on your knees in the morning, taking communion, having your Bible open and saying, Lord, I prepare a landing strip in my heart for you to be richly present in my life today. Every decision I have to make, every interaction I have with other people, I don't want to be the author of the, of the verbiage. I want you to speak through me. I want your spirit to be active and alive in me and not be thinking like, oh, I don't have to bother God with that one. It's not important to him. It's really important to him that we do what he sent us here to do. And now it says in verse 5, a steady stream of people were coming out from Jerusalem and the whole surrounding countryside came to him in the wilderness to be baptized by him. And while they were publicly confessing their sins, he would immerse them in the Jordan River. And here's another one of those buts in verse 7. Another group of people came. But <laughs> when he saw many coming from the elite, wealthy Jewish society, and many of the religious leaders known as Pharisees come in to witness the baptism. Like, what do you think I'm going to say? Something good or bad? <laughs> it's not good, right? He didn't have a high opinion of these people. And you might say, well, we're not supposed to be mean to other people. And that's true. We're not. And Jesus never sinned, but Jesus was angry. 
So it's possible that you could be angry about something and not sin. And the thing, if you look through the Bible, through the four Gospels especially, the thing that got Jesus the most upset was a religious attitude by the leaders in the church because it devalued the relationship with God. They started taking the glory to themselves and they started leveraging their authority over the people who needed the most help. And that's injustice. So the very people who were supposed to be bringing the word were not. They were living in a safe place, worried about their own kingdom. And we better watch that one today, shouldn't we? So he looks at them and he gives them pretty much the Patterson version here. He began to denounce them saying, you offspring of vipers. Ouch. That's a great way to start a conversation. Who warned you to slither away like snakes from the fire of God's judgment? <laughs> All right, so nice to meet you too. You had me at hello. No, not really. But that's what prophets do. If you look in the Old Testament, often they'll say, consider your ways. That's not usually a good word. If they say consider your ways, it means you're doing something that is not in line. Never mind that you're the ones who are supposed to be bringing the good news to these people. You've taken the glory to yourself. And it's not going to end well if you don't change. And I love this. Verse 8 says, you, Pharisees, wealthy elite, people who think you're better than everybody else, you must prove your repentance by a changed life. That's the currency of the kingdom of God, a changed life. How many have experienced a change in your life since you become a Christian and you know the Lord? I mean, really, if, if, if that's not true in your life yet, please be in touch so that we can pray with you and try to help bring the kingdom into your life. Because that's all we're doing. We're just trying to help. Right? We're not doing it for you. We're just acting as intermediaries between heaven and earth and saying, look, we have authority because he set us free. And so many people around the world are still getting free from sin. Uh, and then he's still a little rough with him. He says, don't presume you can get away with merely saying to yourself, we're Abraham's descendants. And maybe we would say, my parents are Christians, so I can get in on their coattails. No. And then he gets really very firm. Verse 10 says, the ax is now ready to cut down the trees at their very roots. Every fruitless, rotten tree will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. All right, so can I just give a little perspective on this? It's like, by praying often and having a picture of God as a loving father and knowing that he wants to give you the game plan for your life. And we're all so complex that it could never be the exact same game plan for any two people. Now, in a marriage, he will tune you both together so that you can both be more effective because you're together. But Trisha's calling is different than mine, but because we're married, we have to consider each other's calling in order for the you know, the, the sum of the parts to equal a greater thing than the parts themselves. Familiar with that concept? When we're operating together, then we can also act as a sharpening tool for each other because iron sharpens iron. And I can want her to flourish in, in her gifting and she can want me to flourish in mine. And together, because we're there helping, that, that works. But if we're adversarial, that's a problem. Now I'm mistreating God's daughter and she theoretically could be mistreating God's son. Not that that's ever happened. <laughs> we learn, you know, you learn. It's not easy, but you learn. And John said, look, you guys, too important for me to just pass over this. The ax is coming out, and who's ever not bearing fruit, that tree gets cut down, because God's about moving the kingdom in the earth. And if you're just going to build your own thing and stop on the journey and just enjoy everything to yourself, that tree's coming down because that's not going to bear good fruit for the kingdom. It's going to bring a reproach to the kingdom because it's all about you and not about God. Those who repent, I quoted this already, I'll baptize in water, but there's a man coming after me who's going to baptize you by submerging you into a union with the Holy Spirit. Ho, oh, the spirit of holiness and with a raging fire. And he comes, you know this portion, he comes with a winnowing fork in his hands. That's the reference to the threshing floor. They would throw the wheat up in the air and the, the straw would blow in the wind and the grains of wheat would fall down, right? And I hope you all know there's still plenty of wheat in our lives. There's still plenty of chaff that needs to be burned off, right?
And you can think of examples in your own life, but anytime you're obsessed with something, like too much hours on Facebook or whatever, too much time in the news, too much time on the election, and not enough time in the Word of God, then you can get yourself all scrambled. It's not going to bear good fruit. Bearing the fruit of the kingdom is bringing the kingdom into the earth for changed lives. <laughs> Thank you. And I don't think we're supposed to be blunt and angry at people like John the Baptist necessarily, but we do have to speak the truth in love. And let me tell you, if there was ever a time that was needed, it's today. In November of 2020, Thanksgiving coming up, you might be with family members that want to just get into a brawl, you know, a, a discussion that, that might not end well. You know, just ask the Lord. Just say, Lord, help me see this person through your eyes. Because my eyes, I know that I'm getting very Sicilian in what I would want to do and give them four flat tires when they go outside and whatever. You know, slip a little x lax in their meatballs. <laughs> no, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. They're not your enemy. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness. And, you know, you don't change something by being the thing you hate. <laughs> you change something by showing them a different way of approaching things. And they're used to slapping back, right? They're used to getting in an argument and a brawl. But is it... Is it redemptive for the kingdom? You have to make that decision. But Jesus found a way to walk that narrow road that leads to life. He found a way to talk to people without shaming them and still get the truth out about his position. And it was so attractive to them that they're like, well, I don't really know what it is, but I want it. Because whatever you got, I want more of that. Wouldn't that be good if they said that after Thanksgiving? Yeah. Pass the gravy. And give me some of that anointing. <laughs> so back to the beginning now, but end now. Um, because remember, Jesus said, I'm going to tell you a story that will talk about persistence in prayer. Why you should always pray and never quit. So I hope anything I said today helps you understand that it's a journey. To learn how to be a really effective prayer person, which is just a huge part of your life, to be in covenant relationship with the Lord and be not just speaking to him, but hearing from him, then you have to pray always. Even when you're at work, even when you're driving. Well, when you drive around here, you sure better be praying, right? Because people are crazy around here. Worse in Essex County where we came from. But like you're going to be praying in tongues just to know what to do on the roads closer you get to New York City, right? So like why wouldn't I invite him in? So that's the language. He said he told them a story that they should always pray and never give up. And my goal was that by the end of this, you'd think about it a little differently than when I said it an hour ago. <laughs> I don't know if that happened or not. But, man, I hope you get it. I hope you get it. It's not a big, hard thing to do to pray. It's not a hard thing to have a prayer life where you're hearing the Lord when you speak to Him. But He doesn't force Himself on you to do that. Amen? And He says, verse 8, God will grant justice quickly. How many, when he returns, will he find on the earth who have faith? Can we stand? And can you lift your hand and say, he's going to find me in faith when he comes back. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? That this persistent widow, it's not the story of the unjust judge. It's the story of the persistent widow. And like, Lord, no matter what's going on in the culture, when you come back, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to still be hammering at that judge's door and saying, I want justice because I know your way is better than the culture's way. And it's not just this culture, it's any culture. Jesus operates in a different kingdom. And we should be his people that are operating in the kingdom in the earth, right? So ambassadors for Christ, all of us. And Lord, when you come back, you're going to find me in faith. I will always pray and never give up. Is that a stretch for you to say that? I will always pray and never give up. I will always pray and never give up. Oh, man, I hope that becomes real to you. That would make me really happy.